evening, um, yesterday evening, I guess, and so, and then losing an hour this morning, I feel like I didn't have quite as much time as I would like to prepare the message, but I pray that God will speak to us this morning. I have faith that He will. Grab your Bibles and turn to the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. Our text this morning will be one verse, verse 31 there. I'd like to read it to you, give you a second to get there. 22nd chapter of Luke, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have it, that he may sift you as we. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we're most humble, Lord, to come before your presence this morning. God, we thank you for another day of life that ultimately, Father, we don't deserve. Yes. But God, you bring us here together in your house, Father. We're thankful for it. God, we're thankful, Lord, for your word. And as we break the bread, bread of life together this morning, you, we pray that you would Speak to our hearts, Father God. I pray that you lift up those, Father, who need lifting up, Father God. I pray that you would prick the hearts of those who hearts you might need to prick, Father God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In verse 31 there, it's, it's Thursday night. It's the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus and his twelve disciples, being Jews, they are observing the Passover feast. Now the Passover feast, it was a meal that the Jews every year that um, they partake in sort of to celebrate God through Moses leading them out of, if you remember, Egyptian bondage all of those years before. And here Jesus and his disciples, they are in the famous upper room that we've heard so much about that Jesus had sent John and Peter, if you remember, He had sent them ahead to prepare this room and to go and prepare a place where they could go and celebrate and observe the Passover meal together. A meal that many of us call the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. Now the sun is set and Jesus, He takes the bread. He breaks the bread. And he, after the meal, He holds up the cup. And he tells each of his disciples there, he says, divide this up amongst each of you. He said, this represents my broken body. And this represents my blood that I'll shed for you. He says, partake of it, eat of it in remembrance of me. It's at this time during this meal that our Lord establishes our communion or the Lord's Supper, whatever you prefer to call it. When he tells us to continually do these and partake of these, so that we will always remember the sacrifice that of His body that He gave for us on Calvary's cross. And I brought this morning um, some juice and some bread later after the service. We're going to partake. We're going to have communion together this morning. But the Lord establishes communion. And in there, when they're sitting there in this meal together, you remember He looks over and He says, but one sitting here that's eating with us will betray you. And they all ask him, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Is it, is it me that's going to betray you? And then a little later in the meal, he looks over at Peter. And he tells Peter, to ver he speaks to him what we see there in verse 31. He says, Satan has desired to have you. Now that's not the first time in God's Word when we see that Satan is after or desires to have one of God's faithful. I remind all of you in the book of Job, you remember how Satan went to God and Satan desired to have Job. Satan desires, I'm afraid, friend, to have many of us this morning Amen. as God's people. But then Jesus says something very interesting there. Jesus says that He may sift you as we. Now that, that really jumped out of me. And I imagine if you remember, here back, I preached a sermon in here that I called from the wash pot, from the wash pan to the bread pan. And we talked about how bread was made in biblical times. 
We went from the harvest field to the threshing floor where the grain was beaten and separated from the shaft. And then we went from the threshing floor to the winnowing fan. If you remember with the winnowing fan, the mixture was thrown up and the wind would blow and would separate the lighter stubble and the lighter chaff, chaff from the heavier wheat which would fall down. But I left out a process. And you remember the winnowing we talked about was in the Bible, it's a representation of, well, the judgment. It's when the unsaved are separated from the saved. And the unsaved, the chaff, blows away, and we talk about it being thrown into oven, whereas God would gather His wheat together in the winnowing stage. But we left out the process of sifting. Now, many of you in here who are cooks, you're familiar with the process of sifting flour. Flour, however you like to say that. Who, who knows how? Who can tell us about sifting flour? What's the process? What what's what is the sifting for? Take out the lumps, make it flour, so that the the end result is more desirable, right? So that it can be used by the baker. Well, it's very similar to sifting wheat. What Jesus is talking about here when he mentions to sift. To wheat. You see, they would take what was called a seed, and after the threshing was done, and after the winnowing was done, and the wheat had fallen back down to the ground, they would take a seed. Now, I don't know how it was constructed. It was probably woven maybe of some type of coarse hair, or maybe it was small wire that had been um, woven together, but the wheat would be put in this seed and would be tossed around or shit, maybe shook a little bit so that the wheat would fall through and then everything that's left is the undesirables. Maybe a stone, maybe the pebbles, maybe a little bit of chaff that was left in there, but the undesirables was left over and the desirable, the pure wheat would fall through that that could be used. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. Now, I want you to note that sifting takes place in the life of the believer. Now the winnowing we already said is taking place where the unsaved and the saved are separated one from the other. But the sifting takes place. We're only dealing with wheat here. We all know that Peter was an apostle. Peter was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Peter was the one being sifted. Peter was a believer. And sifting takes place in the life of the believer. Jesus says, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. In other words, what he's saying is, Satan, Peter, he desires to have you. And say he, des he desires to sift you and tempt you to bring out your worst. He wants to bring out the worst in Peter. He wants to bring out your rocks. He wants to bring out your stubble. He wants to bring out your stones that's undesirable and that can't be used. And this was the case in the life of Peter. And God's given him a warning there. We know, isn't it great? It's, I think it's amazing how when Satan intends to take something and tempt us and use it to bring out our worst. But God can use the very same thing. And God, and whereas Satan wants to destroy and, and cast us down and make a negative, negative out of us, God can take the very same thing, brother and sister. He can take the very same thing and He can build up and He can encourage and He can make a positive out of it. That's right. The life of Peter. We know what happens with Peter. We know that from our story here, just a few hours later, what happens? What's he do? He denies Christ three times before the rooster crows. Remember the story? But later on, what's God do? God uses this trial to build up Peter, to make a mighty vessel out of Peter that he is used in the hand of God time and time and time again that we see in the Scriptures. It's amazing. But Satan can use where Satan tempts to bring out our worst God, you see, He can use the very same trial, the very same tribulation, whereas Satan tempts to bring out the bad, God tests to bring out the good. Amen. God tests Amen. to bring out our best. And that is the sifting of the wheat. Same trial, but the difference is whether it falls through that sieve or not. What's pure and what's holy and what's useful passes through and the stubble and the stone and everything else does not pass through 
deceived. So for me, verse 31, it provokes a question this morning. In which I've entitled my message, Would you pass through the sea? I want us to ask our, ourselves this question this morning. Would you pass through the sea? More pure, more usable, more desirable to God. Or in the time of safety, does it bring out our worst? For the next few minutes, I want us to look at the things that, friend, always pass through the sea. As we ask ourselves, would you pass through the sea? Number one, if you're taking notes, holiness. Holiness passes through the sea. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. When the Christian is sifted, there is going to be one of two results. There is going to be holiness or righteousness or there is going to be sin. It depends on what choice that we make. That's the case all the way back in whenever the serpent tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you remember with the very first sin, that's the case in our lives every single day as he tries to trip us up by our personal desires and weaknesses. And friends, say amen if you know that Satan knows our weaknesses. Amen. But it's important to note that we do have a choice. It's our choice. We are not forced. Ultimately, we choose whether we are going to do right or whether we are going to do wrong. We choose whether we're going to live a life of holiness if we choose holiness or if we are going to choose sin. But the difference, friend, a lot of times, our choices is what our choices are based on. Friend, there's only one thing under the sun. There's only one thing on earth that determines what is right and determines what is wrong. And that is the Word of God. That's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be. But see, a lot of people, a lot of times we find ourselves in trouble when we're sifted in life. A lot of times when we're put through that trial and tribulation, a lot of times we get in trouble because we base our choice that we make on something other than God's Word. That's right. You hear stuff all the time. Well, my daddy, my daddy had to steal, but he done it to put food on our table whenever we were children. Well, daddy might have had a good reason, but praise God, daddy was still a thief. It's still wrong to steal. We cannot base, you can't base your, your decisions that you make on morals because everybody's morals are different. This week, uh, employees, our guy, a young guy, 21 years old, is working with us. And I was talking with him there, and he and his girlfriend, they are shacked up at his mother and his daddy's house. And I got to talking with him there and, and, and had a conversation with him, and I asked him, I said, so you're staying in a room in your parents' house. I said, and they don't have a problem with you and her being involved in premarital relations. He said, no, they don't have a problem with it. They're fine with it. They just want us to be protected. Friend, I'm here to tell you this morning, it's not, it don't matter if it's okay with mama and daddy. It don't matter if it's okay and if it meets mama and daddy's right. standards. What matters is that it meets God's standards. Amen. That's what's important, friend. And the sad truth is that today, most Christians do not know what God's standards are. That's right. And that's just the truth. That's right. And it's nobody's fault but our own. We don't, we don't know what the Word of God says. We don't know what the Word of God and how the Word of God says live. It's, been, it's few and far between when you can catch a preacher. You used to a preacher, when you left church, you felt like sometimes you got your toes stepped on. And people would laugh and say, hey, God showed me today what I need to work on. But a lot of times, we don't get that anymore. And you know, we don't hear that word much anymore of conviction. The conviction that I got by the preaching of the Word of God. What we base our choices on, they're changing. Friend, we base right, and a lot of time, what we consider right and wrong as a Christian is not based on the Word of God, but it's, it's, well, just as long as we do a little bit better than the world does. 
The work, but see, here's the problem. See, the world's standards and the world's morals, they're constantly changing. And if we pick up and we're just a little bit behind the world's morals, we look back, we have gotten away from God's standards. Friend, listen to me this morning. The definition of marriage, it changes. It's changed and it's going to change. What you can legally smoke in a state, it changes. The length of skirts changes. The screening of what can be watched on television, it changes. The government, it changes. Music changes. But there is one infallible truth, free in one book that I hold in my hand this morning that does not change. It will not move. It cannot change. It's in there. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. Always has been always will be the Word of God should be where we as Christians set our morals and set our standards and it is immovable. And Satan, friend, he is going to test us and he's going to put us through the trials and the tribulations of life and the only thing that will pass through that sea is holiness. Amen. Now I like what Brother said earlier. It's not on my holiness and it's not on what I've done, but it's only because it's not of my works. It's only because of what Jesus Christ done, but because of what Jesus Christ done. And when I accepted his, my, Him as my Lord and Savior and that supernatural transformation took place in my life and my body became that temple in which the Holy Spirit should dwell, yes, it's not by my holiness, but because of His holiness, I should strive and I should try to be Christ-like and like Him. Friend, I encourage you this morning. Do right because it's right. Live to be holy. Strive to live for God because holiness passes through the sea. Would you pass through the sea? Number two. Humility passes through the sea. Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Have you ever noticed that the, the most godly people a lot of time that you know are also most of the time the most humble people that you know? You ever notice that? That's right. And a lot of time the reason for that is because those people, they had been through the sifter. Those people have been through the trials. Those people have been through the sea. And instead of them allowing that trial and that tribulation to make them bitter, and instead of them allowing that hard time in their life to make them angry and to make them a gossip and a backbiter, instead they decided that they were going to let it humble them and that they were going to let it shape them and mold them into that person that God can use. The famous hymn writer, Fanny Crosby, when she was a child, she was completely blind. She wasn't born blind, but it was because of a mistake. Come on in, sister. Come on in here. Fanny Crosby was blind because of a mistake, an error that her doctor had made treating the illness that she had had. Maybe you've heard of the name. And she had every right to be angry. And she had every right to be bitter because of what this doctor had done to her. But later in life, it was said that she went to her friend and said that she wished she could meet that doctor one time because she would thank him. Because of him and because of what he had done to her, that the very first face that she would recognize whenever she got into heaven was that of her Lord and Savior. And instead of being bitter and instead of being angry, she decided she was going to let, when she went through the sifter, she decided she was going to let it humble her and she used that humility so that she could have a positive outlook on her life. You know, the Bible also speaks time and time again of the trials of the Apostle Paul. One of those trials that sticks out in my mind is when he speaks of, if you remember in Corinthians, the thorn that was in his flesh. You remember that? And, and scholars say some believe that it was his eyesight, and some believe that it was something else. But what we, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say. But what we knew the, the, do know is that God did not take this thorn from his flesh. 
And instead of Paul being angry with God, and instead of Paul quitting on God because he was having to go through this sifter and it was unfair and this trial and this tribulation, and instead of him giving up on his ministry and getting bitter, instead of all of that, you know what Paul done? Paul's thankful for it. He says, I'm glad that I have it. I wouldn't take anything for it because of this thorn in my flesh. He says, that is the reason why I am humble. Think about that. Humility, friend. Humility is where compassion comes from. Humility, that's where perseverance comes from. Humility is where patience and empathy, sympathy, the, all these things, that traits that God uh, would want to be in His Christian, they come from humility. What about repentance? Repentance is a good one. Repentance comes from humility. It's when the Christian is humbled and said, you know what? I've done wrong. And the Christian accepts what he's done and he humbles himself and then he turns back in his humility to a God that loves him because of humility. You know, one in my mind that stands out is one of the greatest reasons why God wants His children to be humbled because it's in humility when I and when other Christians is in our humility when we stand there and we say, God, this storm is greater than I am. God is more powerful than I am. I can't do anything to change it. I can't do anything to overcome it. All I can do, Father, is place it in Your hands. All I can do is put 100% of my faith in You and place this trial and place this tribulation in Your hand. I give it all to You. By faith, I can't do anything about it. Yes. And you know what? That's exactly where God wants His children. Yes. He says His burden is light. He wants us to place it on Him. And He wants us to come to us. I love that song that says, Just protect me in the hollow of your hand. That's exactly where God wants you. And you put yourself there when we are humble. And we live light, humble lives in humility. God, I, I put 100% of my faith in you, God. And that takes me to my final point. I'm trying to hurry. I want us to have communion this morning. My final point this morning, hope. Hope passes through the sea. Romans 8, 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Another word for hope there that we use more often than we probably would recognize more so is that word faith. Faith and hope, it's the same thing. You know, probably more so than anything else. God allows trials and God allows tribulation and God allows tests in our life so that He, through that, might strengthen our faith. Friend, untested faith is weak faith. Untested faith is weak faith. And I like this guy because of this, not only because of his name, but he was a giant out of faith. His name was Smith Wigglesworth. It's all right, and Smith Wigglesworth, but listen to what he said. He says, from great fights will come great faith. Think of that. From great fights, he says, from your fights is where great faith comes from. What he's saying, what he means by those fights, he's talking about those trials. He's talking about those tribulations. And you say, why does God, why does God have to put me through those hard times? Why did I have to go through that? Why does God have to put me through those tribulations? Doesn't God know how strong my faith is? Yes, friend, God knows how strong your faith is. But the problem is, we don't know how strong our faith is. And He allows us to go through those trials. And He allows us to go through those tribulations so that we can see where our weaknesses are. And we can see where our faith needs to be strengthened and we can see how we need to be maybe lifted up in our faith. Realize, friend, that it takes the trials of life that we tend to dread so bad but it takes those trials to make our faith stronger. That's where our Christian walk is built up. That's where our strength comes from. Amen. And Scripture teaches us I mean, get this. Scripture teaches us that we should so desire this growth, that we should so desire to have a, a, a closer walk with God and a, a stronger testimony 
that we should find joy and comfort in the trials of life. Think about that. In James it says, count it all joy when we fall into divers temptations. That's a tough pill to swallow. For you think about that. Are we at the place in our Christian walk when the hard times and the trials and the tribulations that are so tough, we count them as blessings so that our faith might be strengthened. Faith. Hope. Faith passes through the sea. Holiness. Humility. And hope. They when, when life sifts us, those three, that's what passes through. And I asked you this morning, friend, would you pass through the sea? And this morning, I want us to have a hymn of invitation. And as we sing together, if there's any here that would like to come and, and repent and, and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I'd like to take the Bible and show you how to be saved this morning.